Hello, I'm Mark Baer. Welcome to the Joe Cupcake Chronicles. Hopefully you've been watching um, these many episodes. This would be episode 15. This is Sisyphus Rocks, The Discreet Charm of Bourgeois Joe. This is the last in the series and we are in episode three, so this is the conclusion of this piece. In this episode, Joe, who has been working himself steadily up the ladder of World Corp, has been charged with finding the company mascot. I, I won't give it away who he brings in, but a horse is a horse, of course, of course. Joe has his doubts about this because here's a company bent on t testosterone and global domination, and he feels maybe a gilding isn't the most appropriate mascot. All this sounds a little uh, serendipitous, but in the end, Joe rises to the occasion. This would be a good time to talk about the crown of empowerment. And Joe, where's the crown of empowerment? Imagine yourself wearing a crown of empowerment. It allows you to do more than you think you can do. I was always inspired by Jughead in Archie Comics who uh, was able to walk around with a uh, crown on and I always thought this was a great thing. We made all our coats, uh, our collages, Joe's mannequin, but this was the last prop of, of, the, of the piece and uh, Joe ends up with the crown of empowerment and he succeeds and he wins the day. There is a happy ending and World Corp is gone and absurdity is back. Later over drinks, Matisse recounted his trip to Tahiti, how he could stare in the water and fish for hours, and Joe confessed that he dreamed of living in a Gauguin painting. He imagined the bluest of blues and the greenest of greens, mysterious dark gods and cocoa-colored girls with extravagant flowers in their hair. Joe could see himself washed up in French Polynesia, sandals, shorts, no shirt, stubble, brown as a berry, a pot belly. He'd know flamboyant characters, vagabonds, roustabouts, freebooters. He'd sip cafe au lait at the portside bar where men swallowed beer at 8 a.m. and puff chitons. But what would Joe do for money? Even for Gauguin, the artist's life in French Polynesia was challenging. Mm, Joe could photograph fruit like he did at home and maybe print them on newfangled material, brushed metal or glass, have a gallery at the Hilton. And he would eat his fruit, not like Matisse. But with tourists who wouldn't buy Gauguin's, where do we come from, what are we, where are we, fork out for Joe's pineapples. That squashed that thought to pulp. Then lightning hit. A juice manufacturing plant, his face on the can, juice de Joe. Joe Mango, Joe Guava, Joe Banana. He'd run the tasting room, rum smoothies, and the luscious pink Lydia would oversee the factory. Thump, thump, thump. Not the beat, beat, beat of the tom-toms. Not Cole Porter. Joe knew that thump. Mrs. Cupcake. We come like Adam and Eve with curiosity, gladness of heart and joy. And if we get booted from this paradise, there is always another paradise down the road. Joe discussing Buñuel was explained to his friend Eddie the word dysphemistic, that if someone at a formal dinner party were to publicly announce, I'm off for a piss, the effect would be dysphemistic. Eddie replied, I met Buñuel when I was a kid in France. He had a crush on my mom. Horny old goat offered me a cigarette. I was all 12. Joe asked Eddie about his dozen cats and many dogs and what the good news is. He says, there is no good news. Only that he played golf that afternoon, shot a 78, and it was a beautiful evening in the desert, and he was out by the pool and about to sit in the hot tub. Joe said, that sounded pretty good. God damn it, Eddie replied, not cheering up. I come home this afternoon and see helicopters overhead, and I turn on the TV to see what is happening, and there's my pot dealer holding a gun to his wife's head. So now I've got to find a new supplier. I'm telling you, man, it never ends. Joe told Eddie about an artist friend who'd called him to find Eddie. Now, some people you could talk to after 25 years and pick up where you left off, until Joe clumsily asked, 
you still have hair, followed by an uncomfortable silence. Did you ask him if you still had that suit? I remember him passed out under the table at the Chelsea Arts Club. A symphony in seersucker. And now he's in every museum in the world and he dates starlets. Hey, when you sculpt a bust of your head in your own frozen blood, good things happen. Lucky you own a few pieces of his work. You're telling me that's my retirement plan. Remember that time I asked the girl he was with, we were going somewhere and she had to go off and meet her brother and I go, hey, when did he get out of jail? Just a joke. And she looks at me and goes, how did you know? Eddie goes, yeah, you got a knack. Joe then mentioned his son's complaint that Eddie had been ranting on Facebook, that he should have confined his Facebook page to pets only. Yeah, he said, even if you don't act your age, you should at least know your age. What about you? You know what time it is in the bubble? As Eddie ranted, Joe heard the whir, whir, whirling, hummingbird hum of the motor kicking in as the bubble retreated like a dirigible silently off in the night, the peanut at the wheel. Joe would often ask, was I rebuffed because I was ahead of my time? Or was mine an idea remotely conceivable but not easily realized because it couldn't be recognized? Author, inventor, and futurist Ray Kurzweil hopes to live forever. He takes hundreds of pills, stays fit, and believes soon computers the size of blood cells will be in our bodies. The idea of enhanced brain functioning appealed to Joe, but how would this new Methuselah class pay their bills? Joe saw himself at 127, competing with 90-year-olds for a job at the takeout counter at McDonald's, or cleaning rooms at La Quinta Inn, part-time only, no medical, already be warehoused on Mars by then. Could he still party down? Those damn kids, a couple of 60-year-olds going at it in the bathroom snorting Lipitor, Maybe he'd be lucky enough to work at a Red Lobster or Applebee's, some southern town where it was warm, having been taxed out of California years ago. Sunday morning, baseball playoffs on TV, Cubs winning but no sound, and Joe can't watch. He's being run ragged. I'm Joe. I'm your waiter. If I don't croak, he'd throw in some geriatric shtick, adjust his back brace, six adults and two kids, church group, four split checks, Shirley Temple, sweet tea, Water with lemon, change that sweet tea to Sprite. Bread and more bread, another Shirley Temple, refills are free. Joe gets the drink but forgets the cherry. He returns with it, holding it by the stem, and they order. Everyone needs something special. No onions, no tomatoes, no olives, dressing on the side. Later, a confrontation with his boss, who is in his 20s. Didn't Joe get the memo about smiling? This is a happy place. He was expected to smile and to wear a fun tie maybe a Hawaiian pattern. Joe, touching silk, a vestige of flusher times, wants to say, Hermes doesn't make funny ties, but doesn't push it. That morning, he'd scan the help wanted ads, each job sounding worse than castration. And who would hire him? What could he do, tell jokes outside the car wash? Worst of all, he was too old to write pop songs. No more, oh baby, baby. He'd be about dwindling 401k plans and estate insurance, and damn if he knew what rhymed with hip replacement or colonoscopy. Hermes doesn't make funny ties, he mumbled. Marshmallow, his assistant, did not respond. He knew Joe would soon return from wherever he went blink and check his email. The last few days had been tense. Still, all in all, life on floor 99 for Joe Cupcake was mostly aces, aces, aces. A social media Instagram strategy had resuscitated Happy Card in Japan, and cube rooms were viable again, despite the devastating initial launch when people mistook them as urinals. Joe extolled efficiency what do I need to know? When do I need to know? Who do I need to know? Why do I need to know? Do I need to know? He got in by 9.45, and he was usually out no later than 1.15. Plenty. He held four or five meetings at once, praising what he called the pinball effect. 
clusters of three or four milled about his conference room, and he'd buzz from group to group, a bee spreading pollen. He'd turn up the heat, get deals simmering, fire up enthusiasm, and let others work out the details. They were all smarter than him anyway. Observers privy to this frantic whirlwind of wizardry, this explosive powwow dance, this colossal superconductor collision of creativity were mightily impressed. Joe, engine of dynamism, got the popcorn popping, kept the plates spinning, lit the gas on all burners, and before the roof blew off, he would pogo out. His afternoons were reserved for what Joe called deep submersion. He was scheduled to be at a conference, but he sent Marshmallow. Let him earn his keep. It was a fine spring afternoon. He'd just blasted out of a deep bunker. His ball scampered, scooted, and died on the lip of the cup. On the next hole, 177 yards steep uphill, par three. The threesome on the green waved him to hit and play through. Joe's five wood poke didn't have much loft, but his ball shot straight as an arrow, cleared the ridge, and he heard a tink sound. When he reached the top of the hill, there was no sign of his ball on the green. It must have hit the flag stick and bounced. Then one of the threesome said to look in the cup. Damn, an ace. With a witness. Oh my God, not just a witness. It was God, goldenrod. Normally, when you make a hole in one, said the big boss, you'd have to buy everyone in the clubhouse a drink. But considering it is 1.47 on a work day, perhaps another time. Goldenrod looked into his eyes like he could read Joe's mind. Jesus, did he know Joe imagined him with his dong painted gold? Was he gonna fire Joe on the spot? At Woco, one worked 70 hours a week, tweeted in the can, texted in the shower. Joe mumbled something about not playing hooky. He was working, meditating, cogitating. Stop talking, stop talking. But Joe was spilling his guts like Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment. Why didn't the peanut reel him in? The two subordinates with Goldenrod, Johnny in the spot, Charlie at the rat hole, loyal Dobermans, were ready to rip Joe to shreds, but stood down when Goldenrod asked Joe if he wanted to join them as a fourth. Joe declined. He knew his real game would all too quickly rear its ugly head and stressed he was on deadline, had deliverables pending. Did he really say that? Why not toss in Cheetah? Tell how the price was right, but that he got wind of temper tantrums and feces being hurled. All cattle, no hat. All kraut, no wiener. How obvious the flaws of others were to him. And conversely, how obvious Joe must be to others. Just because you think you're invisible doesn't mean you are. He thought he dodged a bullet until he attended a company mixer for high up mucky mucks. He had standard riffs he deployed at the push of a button, like a jukebox. Hit B1, and Joe railed against groupthink, dominant logic, shoehorn solutions, said constant deprogramming was needed, and liked to say evolution is smarter than we are, blah, 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 blah. Hit C5, he'd go into brand values, company values, all crap. What we're looking for are stories to communicate the spirit, not the values of a brand. Then someone pressed F11, or it could have been 4A, and he sputtered about how the unplugged, the switched off, the ones able to put down their devices would be the new Mandarin class. Drinking messed with the jukebox, intermingling his real thoughts and his canned thoughts. And he tried to remain sober in public, but apparently Joe was hammered. And when someone pressed D13, which should have elicited, build something great, build community around it, organize and promote, Instead, Joe hushed the room with D14 about a twisted pervert friend who liked a particular style of fetish boots so much that when the company went bust, he bought it. Then, as he piled on the sashimi, trying not to spill his soy and ginger while balancing his wine glass, he did more arms he was spilling, and telling someone about his friend's baby, how he wished he could wear a pajama suit with a back flap and padded feet, but not candy canes or balloons, picturing pinstripes, 
as the other person scurried off, and Joe found himself facing Goldenrod. Your razor broken, Club Cake? Sir? Ace, as a rule of thumb, before I'm ready to go out and clip the planet clean, I make sure I clip my upper lip. Joe felt his upper lip, touched a thin line of bristly mist, glanced in a mirror, saw he had a skinny red wine mustache, was mortified, and now other executives were staring at him. Someone asked, Ace Hole, do we have a new spokesperson yet? Ace Hole, that stung, especially in tandem with his pussy mustache. Joe quipped meekly, everyone loves a movie star. There was speculation. Even Goldenrod joined in, Clooney, Hank, Streisen. Joe didn't say their star would have four legs, not two, if he could close the deal. Marshmallow had just texted, Lassie's people say no, Rin Tin Tin, same. And being the unveiling was a week away, if his last hope didn't pan out, he'd be appearing as Sherry Lewis with lamb chop on his hand. Then his cell vibrated, Marshmallow. Mr. Harvester's agent signed. Joe gave a fist pump, sloshing wine on Mr. Evil Eye's blazer, Miss Haughty Baring's breasts, and on Goldenrod's loafers. Word of the mysterious Mr. Harvester leaked and rumors were rife, but Google as they may, Joe was fairly certain his secret was safe. Indeed it was. And what a happy surprise when the big day came and after the drum roll, out trotted the Palomino gilding bamboo harvester, direct from the glue factory in the sky, now in 3D hologram format, known to the world as Mr. Ed. It was quite a hoedown at headquarters and offices worldwide. Ed was beamed in on big screens sporting a straw boater and sunglasses. Joe played Wilbur. Hey Ed, where'd you get that snazzy hat? Oh, I found it. I'll wear it till it goes out of style, then I'll eat it. Laughs aplenty, and Joe inquired about the shades. Ed whinnied that his eye doctor made him wear them. I went to a Chinese optometrist. I said, Doc, I have a cataract. The doc said, Oh, very good, Ed, very good. Nice car. I have Lincoln Continental. It worked in the room, but would it translate in Shanghai? And Joe wasn't sure about the Swedish meatball horse meat jokes, but was heartened when everyone sang, Of course, of course, unless, of course, it's a talking horse, World Corpse, Mr. Ed. Followed by, Wilbur, we are the world and you're not. Nay, all sales are final. That's when Joe got a text from Goldenrod. My office, tomorrow, 312. To recap, when World Corp bought Absurdity Inc. in a hostile buyout, there was no mixing of cultures. Woco squatted on the floors a hundred and above and rode separate elevators up into the clouds. A staircase led from 100 to 99, where the other 99% worked. Joe was occasionally tempted to ascend the staircase, but there were limits to his audacity. But presently, he was in the nosebleed suite, surrounded by Goldenrod and his shark minions. He heard, The country is a business. The citizens are the customers. Thinking, what could go wrong? Thinking, this was the moment to champion anti-consumer consumerism. Be about lower cost, better value, doing more with less. Be greener, smarter, cheaper, non-toxic. When? Goldenrod motioned Joe into an interior room. What, had Mr. Ed trashed his stall? Or was this the ax? Maybe the elusive obvious had become obvious. Maybe a gilding wasn't the best idea for a virile corporation bent on world domination. But no, it quickly became clear. That wasn't why he was here at all. Goldenrod gripped a putter that was leaning against his desk. A new putting stroke. Ace, what do you think? Saw it on the Golf Channel. He thought, this was a hallucination. This couldn't be what the man who ran the world was really thinking about. Could it? Joe said, stand closer to the ball and more upright. That's it, and keep the wrist stiff. 
6.12 a.m. Joe was in Goldenrod's Porsche going to a posh private course on the stereo 60s hits volume 2. As Goldenrod took the 35 mile an hour freeway entrance at 80, tires were shrieking, Goldenrod smiling as Joe grasped the door and visualized the car flipping in slow-mo to, hey there Georgie girl, put away your dowdy feathers and fly. Goldenrod laughed. This wouldn't be a bad way to go. It would be quick. The man was a maniac. Goldenrod was having fun. No worries. If he went up in flames, Kurtzweil would replace everything. Chips, memory upgrade, motherboard, the works. Joe tried not to react. What good would resistance do? And then Nat King Cole. The lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer. Hot dogs and pretzels and beer. 90 and climbing. Goldenrod driving one-handed, his other hand fiddling with the volume remote. A hundred, as Nat rhymed, weenies and bikinis. Joe fancied himself a word guy, but he would never top Nat. That's why Nat was king. And after the disaster, the jaws of life cutting him out of mangled metal, Nat would still be rhyming, and the chatter would be about Goldenrod's incredible escape. Joe mentioned only as the unfortunate passenger. And when Goldenrod passed a Prius, as a horn blaring sparklets truck sped towards them, Joe closed his eyes. Save me, Nat. I want to do right. I want to do good. Give me a chance, Nat. I could be a contender. He heard, Joe, Joe, Joe. The voices got louder. He opened his eyes. He was on a podium, alive, he assumed. A crowd calling his name. Thank you, Nat. He sang, Solid potato salad, that solid salad jack. Someone in the audience shouted, Absurdity is back! And there was a cheer. It all returned to him in a rush. Goldenrod didn't wreck. And wasn't even totally insane by golf standards. They got to his club at 622 and Goldenrod dashed to mark the first tee with his clubs just ahead of a foursome and a threesome of Japanese women all vying for the 6.30 slot when the first group was allowed off. Five seconds later, they would have been out of luck. Beautiful day, birds singing, no one in front of them. Goldenrod was the man, singing putts, and Joe shot an 84, the best he'd posted in ages. Joe swiveled at the podium, behind him on the screen, the stairway to the hundredth floor, now a rooftop landmark, lit at night, a beacon of hope, in bold letters over picture, the 99% for 100%. Joe recalled the bright meteoric streak crossing the sky, and the headline, up, up and away. World Corp had rocketed off to a tax haven in the Cayman Islands. Everything above the 99th floor was empty air. Even Mr. Ed was gone. But he did leave a golden road apple, not 22 carat like the golden dog turds, just chocolate wrapped in foil, but a nice gesture all the same with a note. Always leave them laughing when you say goodbye. The headline under the fold, Ace Cupcake to Helm Absurdity. There was no introspection. Joe didn't ask, am I up for this? He'd gotten the role, he'd play the part. He turned to the peanut, out. And when he manned the controls, there was a loud sucking pop as the bubble collapsed in on itself and reversed inside out. The audience experienced a sudden distinct flutter vibration like the beating of wings. All in the eye blink, probably nothing. Joe tapped the mic after this hiccup and concluded humbly. I've got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow, got the string upon my finger, World Corp is gone, and I'm in love, oh yeah, thanks be to you, King Cold Hat, I'm the Gato Nuevo, the numero uno cat. And then he said, beep bop loop bop wop bamboo to a standing ovation. He peeked at his watch. He could still squeeze in a twilight round.
sit, be still, and listen. Because you're drunk, baby cakes, and we're at the edge of the roof. Join us, Rumi. Imagine moonlight in a minor key. Our prayers writ large, silver on black. And let us consider an ancient Japanese poem. How the Chancellor's son fell out of favor in the capital and became a ragged gambler. And recall the barefooted wandering musician the townspeople call the Justice's Miss. Her father too was a great official. They were all in their day exceedingly rich. Once their gold was like sand in the sea. Now they have hardly enough to eat. Ah, when you look at others, my dear ones, you can see how gracious heaven has been. Grace, O oh God, go we. Up on the high peaks rocks rolled. The rock, our duty. Our duty, beauty. Up, up, up. The sea, dazzling below, yellow and blue lupin along the river bank, where the doomed daughters of Danius carry water in cracked jars. Hello, my darlings. Love, love, kiss, kiss. I'm gone. Higher, higher, into the breach, into the deep heart's core. Every breath a blessing, every action holy. All around, everywhere, all things flowing. To exist is to change, to change is to mature, to mature is to go on creating oneself endlessly. Matisse, the night before he shuffled off the coil, made one last sketch of his muse, Lydia del Korskaya. Before handing it to her, he inspected the drawing and said, it will do. Joe dreamed he was on a game show. They were picking the perfect girl for him, the perfect mate. They had some science. A name was picked out of a whirling cage, and from behind a curtain twirled out the perfect girl. And it was his wife. He said, wow, isn't that great, sweetie? Said Rumi, come, come, whoever you are. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again. Come, come. What you seek is seeking you. Thank you, beloved, a noble spirit. So beautiful, so deep, so mad. Whatever you are, if you are, if you are not, thank you for everything. I have no complaints whatsoever. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.